This stronghold is linked to many of the great turning points of Scottish history, from the exploits of Braveheart to the Second World War. Now renovated, it's been voted the nation's wedding venue of the year, and Louise Andrew is a proud GM. Louise, it's so lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you, Laura. Thank you for coming all the way to see us from South Africa. Thank you, the honour's mine. Now, every person would love to live in a castle, well, at least I would, but what makes Dundas so special and unique? Dundas is a really special place, Lorna. It has got the warmth of a family home. Nobody needs to be on guard while you're here. So Jack and Lady Lydia like our guests to come on in and treat the castle as their very own whilst they're here. And while I'm on that subject, why don't I take you in to meet Sir Jack and he can tell you more about it. Oh, he's here, what a he treat. Is. Sir Jack has served as a member of the European Parliament, been married to Lady Lydia for 50 years, and the restoration of Dundas has been a labor of love for both of them. Lorna, this is our blue drawing room. And here is Sir Jack. Good morning, Sir Jack. Hello, how are you doing? Lovely to meet you. Very good, thank yeah, you. Thank great. you so much for allowing us into your home. Not at all, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. All the way from South Africa. Lovely. All the way from yeah. South Africa, yeah. Lovely country. <laughs> mm. So, Jack, I'd love to hear about the rich history behind Dundas. There were some very famous Scottish warriors. One was called William Wallace and the other was called Robert the Bruce. And the Dundas is fought with those warriors and won great battles against the English. And then in 1416, Dundas family asked the Duke of Albany, who was then the regent in Scotland, if they could build a keep. And it's still standing today. Oh, tell me more. The Dundases were then there until this house was built in 1818. Now, unfortunately, he, he ran out of money. And therefore, it was sold, first of all, to a Mr. Russell, and then to my great-grandfather, who had been a successful businessman in making sewing thread, Clark's Anchor Sewing Thread. And then? And then he bought Dundas uh, in 1899, he was only there about three or four years, then he died. And my grandfather then lived here, and my grandmother, whose portrait is on the wall there. Um, my parents then moved into Dundas in 1939, the year the war was declared, and was taken over for five years by the RAF as the headquarters of the balloon barrage, which was protecting the bridge, the fourth bridges and that meant we had to get out. When the war came to an end, then my parents moved back here, but of course they didn't really know what to do. They weren't able to build a business or anything like that. Like that. And so for a lot of time, the house was lived in, but, but not properly looked after. You decided to turn this home into a venue as well. What led you to that decision? Nobody can live in a place this size without going bankrupt. Uh, what we were able to do is we were able to have one wing in which my wife and I live with our dogs and, and everything, and the other main part of the house is uh, given for, to corporate affairs. We do uh, over 60 weddings a year, and we have parties from time to time because the, the floor of the room is sprung, so it's been specially sprung so that you can dance highland flings in, in this room. It's a lovely room, and my wife's an interior decorator, and she's made Dundas into what we call the coziest castle in Scotland. In 1450, Dundas Castle was besieged by the Earl of Douglas on behalf of King James II, who then had Douglas assassinated. So it's always been best to keep some form of weapon handy around here. Paul, I've never participated in archery. I think the only thing I know is probably from Game of Thrones. Well, the most important thing isn't really the bow. It's how you stand and how you position yourself. That's really critical, because that's one of the many variables you want to eliminate and keep under control. And we want our feet nice and square, as we say, like this. You're in a strong position then. We then take a grip of the bow, body, three, to stand. There we go, we're good to go. Now we can worry about what we're gonna do with the bow and arrow. Bring it in, slide it in there, and you've got a positive clip, clip in here. So actually feel it, or even hear it click in. As you give it a push, there it goes. When you pull at it, make sure you pull, watch the elbow go up high and then we can look down the shaft and release it towards the target. Should we give it a go? I think oh, it's set you up. I'll load it for you the first time. So when you stand in this position here, so you can line the target. Okay. Take a firm grip, bring your arm up. Okay. And that's when you can make the adjustment into the rest. 
So bring your body round. Yep, like so this. Straight, shoulders round, so it's straight in line with the target. Put your fingers on, you ready? Okay. Go up, pull. That's there. it, bring it down. Good, that'll be over. Okay. Now let it go. we are got to get the target. <laughs> Awesome. That was amazing. So if anybody's looking for a cast member of Game of Thrones, I'm your girl. Paula was amazing. I'm so cold. We're going back inside. Should we go in the See you. Thank you very much. Thanks Have a lovely day. Of the income generated by hosting weddings here, the lion's share goes into restoration. Louise, what are some of the design aspects of this castle? This part of the castle is actually designed over three parts of a square. So here we have four public rooms, three of them interconnecting, looking over the lawns, which is lovely for all of our guests. The architect was William Byrne, and the ceilings are vaulted, a bit like in some of the, the churches and the bigger schools that he built across Scotland at the time. We've got a number of stained glass windows, like this one up here, which floods the hall with natural daylight, and again by the front door as well. The wooden panelling, very, very typical of that time. Has Lady Lydia kept all the furniture, or has some of it changed? A lot of the furniture has been bought in, but it's all antique and it's all functional as well. Everything here can be used. For modern convenience, many of the bedrooms were turned into bathrooms. Louise, this room has so much charm. What inspired the deco? Every room is different, Lorna, and this particular room, as you can see, it has a four-poster bed, which is really, really lovely. Lady Lydia designed all of them, and they spent time putting in 15 ensuite bathrooms as well. So when he inherited the castle, there were two bathrooms, so now every bedroom almost has a bathroom. What would you call this particular style? I would say it's traditionally romantic. Uh, there's little touches everywhere, like, for example, this little stool here at the dressing table and the, the lovely little chairs but every room is individual and some are green some pinks some yellows some have got fabric walls some have got jack and jill basins in the bathrooms but they're all different the library is packed with tales of kings queens and battles louise what happens in this space people come in to relax as you can see, we've got the fire going at the moment and great big comfortable sofas and lots of old books on the walls because this is the library. Has a lot changed since it was inherited by Sir Jack and Lady Lydia? Incredible. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it was the same place. It was, the gardens were completely overgrown, there was no road, water leaking through the ceilings. And in this room, the walls were originally silk. And what she did is she brought that back. So she's replaced all of the walls with lovely new silks, as you can see. I always like to think that it's the heart of the house. It really does have a cozy family feel. It does. And a lot of that is reinforced with all of the family photographs that are around and about. Some of them are black and white and are years old. Others are more current. The solid slate base of the snooker table proved a valuable defence for a young Sir Jack in the early 1940s. I love this room. I think if all the trinkets could talk, they'd have a lot of history to share. There are indeed, and there's an awful lot of family memorabilia as well. We've got Sir Jack's great-grandfather's boots, we have his hat, his flag, his saxophones, we've even got his old wooden cameras, and we've got Sir Jack's gramophone as well, and I opened it up recently, and inside was a recording of Sir Jack when he was younger, singing a song. I believe there's quite an interesting story behind this billiard table. There's certainly an interesting story, and probably more than one, Lorna. During the war, it was moved into the blue drawing room, and if there was a threat of being bombed, Sir Jack, as a boy, and his family would have to hide underneath it to keep safe. Um, but certainly being back here, uh, people use it today and have lots of fun with it. So it's been there for the bad times and the good times? It has, and it's still enjoyed by many people today. OK, Lorna, so now my colleague Morven is going to show you around the old keep. It's known as a keep because in times of war and hostile raids from both north and south, those in the surrounding hamlets who were loyal to the Lord of Dundas could take refuge inside this fortress. So Lorna, welcome to the old keep. This is the original castle built by the Dundas family just over 600 years ago. We're now standing in our medieval stag chamber, which is the heart of the castle. And when the castle was originally the home of the Dundasses, this is where most of the entertaining would have taken place. 
Leading off the Great Hall is also the Laird's bedchamber, and the real signs of his wealth at the time are his big open fireplace and his ensuite facilities. He must have lived like a king. Castle fit for a king. <laughs> Lorna, just mind your footing as we make our way up the 106 stairs to the top. These are the original stairs of the keep, so they're a little bit uneven as we make our way up. In times of danger, from the roof on top of the keep, a beacon fire would be lit to warn others of impending attacks. Similar keeps either side of the River Forth would send warning signals to each other. So when Sir Jack inherited the castle, the initial restoration was of the keep. And at that time, he had to rebuild the entire parapet here. That was one of the first steps um, of the project. But during the Second World War, the keep itself was occupied by the Royal Air Force yeah. and there's, their inscriptions are still here on the original stonework um, as they used this as their headquarters during the balloon barrage on the fourth rail bridge. That's amazing. So here you can see squadron leader R. King wow. and H. Walk. So just adding to the depth of the history of the castle. That's pretty amazing. This place holds so much culture and heritage. It's phenomenal and that is lovely that the family still live here and that, you know, continues to this day. The Germans tried to bomb the bridge to cut northeast Scotland off from the south. Hence the Royal Air Force presence here. The views are amazing. We've got 360 degree views from the rooftop here, but the most iconic view is of the three bridges here. So the fourth rail bridge, which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and then the two road bridges. The new Queen's Ferry crossing was just completed and opened last year. I'm sure that was used for something completely different back then, but you know what? I think I need a selfie up there. Let's go. Great. Once she reached the top, Lorna understood why this castle was worth fighting for. Perfect for a selfie moment. Keep calm and be your selfie.